bad TV, don't you? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> G'day, guys. My name's Joe Perry here from the Oak Barrel, standing in the Oak Barrel tasting room here on this uh, this very, very brisk Thursday night in the heart of Sydney CBD. Uh, tonight's a pretty exciting night, and for those of you uh, tuning along at home, wherever you may be in the world, um, get excited because I am. Uh, we have a full taste room here tonight, uh, about to go through eight different uh, grower champagnes here. We have um, Arthur Lamandia joining us later and Aurelien Lahert here with us, about to take us through these incredible wines. Um, we are going to dive straight on into the action. Um, so first and foremost, um, as everybody in the room can see, and as you viewing along at home can see as well, uh, the person standing next to me or above me, or maybe below me, or maybe side by side, depending on what your screen looks like, um, I did want to welcome uh, Aurelien Lahert all the way from Champagne. Um, looking a lot warmer than we are in Sydney, funnily enough. Um, but uh, Aurelien, g'day, how are you? Oh, we're on mute. <laughs> Some teething issues, yeah. It's better, thank you, sorry. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thanks, Oak Barrels, uh, to, to have uh, this kind of testing. Uh, of course, this is always better to, to be uh, in front of you in real, uh, but uh, it's also great to share a little bit moment. And I have to admit that now we are uh, a lot of works in the, in the growing season, so it's good also for me to do a break and this kind of testing. So I'm very happy to, to talk with you tonight and uh, to explain a little bit our philosophy. And I think this is what you, you, you say first. It's a champagne grower, it's a real quality, and there is a very strong history personality into the wines. And uh, that's also what we try to, to share, to share our passion, our vision of the, the wine, of the, the production, etc. Uh, so maybe uh, I could talk first about the about me and the most important the domain. Uh, I think it's uh, important. And please, if you have any question, don't hesitate uh, to ask. Uh, for me, it's always interesting to to talk about many things, uh, but mostly about wine and uh, vine growing. So I'm Aurélien. I'm the seventh generation of the domain. So the domain was uh, founded in uh, 1889. So it's quite uh, old. But in the same time, I think it's important to remember that uh, Champagne was in a constant evolution. Uh, my grandparents, they were just uh, arrived after World War II, which was a very difficult uh, moment in Europe and also especially in France. So it was uh, not the same work than uh, today, not the same quality. My father arrived in the year 90, and this is where I start to understand that uh, champagne and quality are really important and increase uh, really the potential of the domain. For me, I arrived in 2005 at the domain. I was 21 years old. And for me, after making some practices in different uh, countries, in France, in Europe, etc., I realized that champagne, uh, of course, is the terroir. This is our patrimoine. And I believe that uh, we have to respect that and we have to be very proud. So I think it's uh, important to understand that uh, with this vision of the works, uh, with this uh, potential uh, terroir, we, we could increase really the, the, the quality of the wines. So I arrived in 2005 and after, my idea was uh, to, to contribute to uh, working in a more natural way in the, the, in the vine growing and after, of course, continue in the winemaking. So that's uh, important. We are located in the Côte Sud d'Epernay. So the Côte Sud d'Epernay, this is a sub-region between Vallée de la Marne and Côte des Blancs. Uh, Côte des Blancs, so this is where the, the Larmandier family is coming from. Uh, this is more the Chauc and the Chardonnay. Vallée de la Marne on the left, this is more the clay with Pinot Meunier. So we are in the middle, and in fact, this is with this kind of uh, mixed terroir that we could obtain Pinot Meunier, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, different type of soil with the, the clay, with the silt, uh, a little bit of uh, limestone, and of course the chalk, the chalk which is very important in Champagne. So I think it's, uh, it's great. After that, uh, we uh, are 
not only in Chavo, our village, uh, we are located in 11 different villages. So today, this is 12 hectares of vines spread out 11 villages. It's more than 80 different plots. So of course, you understand that with this kind of diversity, we are able to make a, a lot of different possibilities. Champagne is the region known for the blend. We blend the variety, we blend uh, the vintages, we blend the terroir, we blend maybe probably also different kinds of vinification. But for us as a grower, we are quite proud about our terroir, our variety, our uh, way of working. So this is why uh, not all the time, but sometimes it's very important to put in advance to present a specific plot with uh, the particularity of the variety or the soil, etc. So tonight you will taste uh, the different wines. There will be Les Vignes d'Autrefois, which is 100% Pinot Meunier from a single plot. And for us, this is also a testimony to, to say that this is what we could obtain with a Pinot Meunier from all vines planted on the chalk. So today it's this kind of evolution in Champagne, mostly done by the people like us, by the grower, uh, which makes things really more exciting. Of course, you always have the, the champagne, uh, like the blend for to, to do the celebration, the parties, uh, to, to serve the, by the glass uh, in aperitif. But you, you, I think today you, you have also the champagne to share like a wine. Uh, the, the idea of the, the, the terroir, of the, the complexity from the specific vintage, etc. It's something that we like to put in advance and something that people are enjoying and understand more and more. So is there any question? Not just yes. I think everyone is uh, pretty keen to get stuck into to, to the delicious wines that you're describing. Um, okay, perfect. That is the first, it's the first good thing to, to have an excitement, uh, it, it's great. It is. Uh, really, you mentioned in, in there that, you know, the, the, um, the work done by people like yourselves, like small growers, um, it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware, but uh, maybe I don't know so much there. Um, growers Champagne still represents a, an incredibly, incredibly small part of the, the region. Is that correct? Uh, in fact, uh, just to have a, a quick reminder for Champagne, Champagne, it's a 30... 33,000 hectares of vines. So it's a 300 million bottles a year. Uh, I believe that 80% of the volumes, it's a uh, sell by the big brands. But 80% of the vines are owned by the grower. So of course you understand that there is a lot of uh, exchange. Huh? Uh, the big brands buy the, the, the grapes from the, the growers, etc. Uh, we are, I think, uh, 15,000 growers in Champagne. Only eight of uh, us have uh, make their own vinification. After, you have also the idea of a cooperative. A, co a cooperative is like, a, it's a place that all the small growers come and they share their grapes, their vinification, etc. Uh, for me, I believe that today there is less and less growers but there is more and more good growers. That that's, uh, is not contradictive, but I believe that today, if you, are, if you want, if you have a little bit of passion and that you would like to present something uh, really authentic and coming from you, you have this possibility to make something real with uh, real good quality and personality because there is people uh, in France, in Australia, in the USA, everywhere in the world who are interesting to taste. And, and that's also a kind of very strong motivation for us. After the big brands, uh, I will never say bad things about them because if uh, we are selling wines across uh, more than 45 different countries, this is not just because uh, La Herte Frère or L'Armand de Bernier or Agrappa are very good. This is also because the name of Champagne is put everywhere by the big brands. And you, you, you have some uh, champagne uh, that you could use for uh, every day or with uh, different people that uh, maybe a, a big brand, a name, it's a little, it's a safe uh, taste, I will say. But when you would like to, 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 to discover a little bit more the, the, the different faces of champagne, maybe the growers are here. But it's not competition between the, 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 these two families, it's more to express the diversity. And that's important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree as well. 
Um, so I believe everyone has a glass of the, uh, the Blanc de Blanc at the moment. Okay, um, great, perfect. I'll bring the chart. So, yeah, so the, the Blanc de Blanc, uh, as the name says, it's white wine from white grapes. So in Champagne, it's only Chardonnay. So this is the Chardonnay from the Coteau Sud d'Epernay. I believe that this wine represents the most the domain in terms of terroir, of uh, vine growing, wine making. Uh, so this is the idea of Coteau Sud d'Epernay. Coteau Sud d'Epernay, you have 50 centimeters of clay. So the clay brings the body, the fruit. And then the roots go deeper in the chalk. The chalk that was the limestone, uh, it was an alteration by the sea of the limestone uh, 250 million years ago. So it's quite old, but we still have this uh, patrimoine, and that's very important. The, the mineral salts are transmitted by the roots to the vines until the to the, the grapes, and this is the, the salinity, the very fresh uh, taste that we would like to transmit. So this is why this Blanc de Blanc we do as a Brut Nature. We don't add any sugar. Uh, you know that the sugar, but not uh, now, but a few years ago, I mean like 10 years ago, the, the sugar is probably more the what the world know and enjoy the most. After question of, of acidity, of bitterness, you need to have a minimum of uh, education and to enjoy fine food and find a find the wines to, to, to enjoy it. But for me, I believe that uh, this freshness, this sapidity, it's really what we are looking for, for champagne and uh, also sparkling wines. Mm -hmm. uh, so Blanc de Blanc, Chardonnay, it's quite easy to, to recognize in terms of flavors and uh, of aromatics. What we like to do is to get a good maturity. And then we are working with traditional pressing so it's a basket press of uh, 4,000 uh, kilos. The juice go by gravity and are going uh, directly fermented in barrels or the food. The food, it's a big one. It's like 5,000 uh, liters. The idea of the oak, it was influenced a lot by my uh, father. In the years 80, it was uh, starting again to work with more uh, fermentation and vinification in barrels. Uh, it's a continuity. The, the, the natural works you do in the vines, you have to do the, on the same way for the vinification. Uh, and with the, the barrels, when it's not new, because I think it's important for us to are not using too much new oak. Uh, we are not looking for vanilla or things like that. But the idea of the barrels is the oxygen enter through the oak to the wines, make some oxygenation. And the leaves who are on the bottom of the barrels brings the reduction. And with this, you obtain a kind of, uh, not an harmony, but a kind of uh, balance. And the wines have a natural evolution uh, to open the flavors, but also keep the acidity. So for me, it's really a, 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 like a cycle. Here, it's also what we call non-vintage. So non-vintage means that you, uh, you blend two different uh, two or three or more vintages. So this is, you are with the base 2017, and there is 50% of reserve wines from the two previous harvests. The idea is the oldest make the education of the youngest, and the youngest bring freshness energy, like in normal life. It's uh, with this, you, you have, is not to keep the, the taste of the domain, years after years. It's really to have a notion of balance between richness and also acidity. Yeah, immediately I get that, um, that, uh, that salinity and that freshness on the nose straight away. Um, what, what does everybody think about the, the first wine that we've tried? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> for, for, for me, this kind of wine are also important that you, you could drink really easily. The, the, the idea is the, you are not, uh, you don't have to be alcoholic and to, to want to finish the bottle. But when you, you drink a glass, you want to take another one because you have enough richness complexity. You have something in the, the power in the mouth, but the finish is very clean. And after that, you could start to eat a few things or to take another glass or an, uh, a glass of another wine, etc. So for me, this is... Always when we are making wines and uh, also the wines that we like to drink at home, it's the kind of wines rich, complex, but never fat. 
to always have the idea of freshness and minerality. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I see this in the wine, uh, this wine right now. Um, you mentioned the that this was 50% uh, 17 base vintage, and then uh, the rest was blended in two vintages before that. How... Um, you know, how important is, I assume quite important, how important is, is vintage for you in Champagne and does the, um, the, the condition of the vintage reflect your final blend for, say, the, the Brut Nature uh, Blanc de Blanc? I think, uh, first, vintages uh, wines in Champagne, I, I believe it represents maybe less than 5% of the total production. At the domain, it's higher. It's probably 15% because we believe that vintages are important. And this is also kind of a challenge for us to do our best in the vines, in the vinification, and to be very proud to present a wine every year. Uh, for me, the, of course, 17 was a year quite difficult. Uh, we had a lot of rain uh, a month before the a month before the harvest. So the, the, the botrytis was coming a little bit, especially of the Pinot Meunier. Uh, but we, after with a viticulture quite uh, important in terms of quality, you obtain very, very good things. Uh, compared to the previous vintages, like uh, 16, 16 was totally different. It was end uh, of September, very low yield, very strong concentration. So for me, each vintage, have a very strong uh, typicity and personality. We have to reflect that. After, it's, uh, I think it's difficult because it's a question of the, of the grower or the winemaker, as you want. For me, I'm more a grower than a winemaker. I'm considering more like that. Uh, for me, I want to transmit the characteristic of the year. And there is probably some people who would like to transmit more the characteristic of the variety or the characteristic of the terroir or, or etc. It's, it's really difficult. Um, there is some good vintages, like uh, the 2016 have a very good potential and we'll test uh, later. The 2012, 2008, 2002, uh, probably 19 also were coming well, well, in the cellar. So it's uh, for a few years. But uh, also, it's a little sad to say that, but uh, global warming, it's uh, still helpful for us in Champagne. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder, my, uh, my grandfather was doing the harvest in beginning of October. My, my father was doing harvest uh, middle of September. And for us, this is already 2003, 7, 11, 18, that we started harvest in end of August. So the, the notion of vintage uh, are, are changing and evolute uh, quite uh, quite fast. Yeah. Wow. That's um. Cool. I think we've um we've just moved on to the the second wine there, the Alter Perfect. Uh, that one has in their glass just now. So Ultra Dition, it's the the blend of the terroir, the variety, the kind, the different vinification and also the vintages. So here we are really in the spirit of what is uh, the classical approach for uh, champagne winemaking. Of course, the, the, we have also this, uh, the same uh, uh, potential for the, the quality that we do in the vines. After that, it's coming from Vallée de la Marne, a little bit uh, Côte des Blancs and also uh, Côte au Sud des Pernay a lot. This is a blend of 60% Meunier, 30 Chardonnay and 10 Pinot Noir. The Pinot Meunier, the, the, like the classical uh, personality for Meunier, it's very fruity, a little bit the, the yellow fruit, uh, apricot kind of thing, peach, uh, a little bit nutsy when it's uh, aged a little bit in the, in the bottles and not of a strong finish. For us, with the viticulture we are doing, we try to get fresh fruit character and always very good liveness. This is a, a wine for me really easy to enjoy by a lot of people because you have the fruitness, the aromatic, it's generous, but also you have uh, this uh, sapidity on the finish. We are doing uh, here a dosage of uh, four grams per liter. So this is what we call extra brut. Extra brut, this is less than six grams. See, would you have any, any comments on the, the second wine, the old tradition that we're trying in comparison to the first? Yeah. 
It's really interesting how when you the nose or when you smell, it's sort of just like sherry, but then the taste is nothing like sherry. Yeah, so you've got the freshness and the, the champagne ness, and yet it kind of has that sherry like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm yeah. So the, the, the comment on, on the, the, the old tradition there, Aurelien, was that there is almost like a, like a hint of a Fino Sherry esque um, yep. nose compared, but still getting the freshness on the palate that comes through. And maybe that leads back to the barrels, like you were talking about, with the, the oxidative character coming through. Um, yep. This is the evolution of the Pinot Meunier. And uh, when, here, it's a 40% of reserve wines, and the 40% of uh, these reserve wines are only coming from Pinot Meunier. And uh, I think the, the, the comparison with the, the, the Fino, it's uh, exactly that because well, Champagne is not oxidative, but the, 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 the flavors from the secondary and third, the third flavors character are here to give another dimension. For me, it's always to, to get the fruit, but also a kind of uh, oxidative profile who makes uh, something more complex and elegant. And again, we are in Champagne, we have the choke, so we like to get this kind of uh, freshness. It will be, Pinot Meunier will never have the same uh, freshness and finesse than Chardonnay, the Blanc Blanc you taste uh, before, but you could obtain some uh, very good uh, purity and uh, is interesting, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I feel immediately, I don't know if anybody else gets this, but I definitely feel the fruitiness and this one's a little bit more open and um, like the, the, the Blanc de Blanc had that, that freshness and that raciness. And then with the, the, uh, the dominant Pinot Meunier in here, just a little bit more roundedness. And like Rillian was saying before, maybe in a meal, you would start with the, the Blanc de Blanc and then moving in here is your little aperitif, your starter, uh, whether, whether what it would be shellfish or, or light meats or anything like that. And um, again, it's something that I'll probably mention a few times throughout the night, but another one of those things that draws me to um, your wines, William, but, but grower champagne in general is, is the, the, the complexity and um, the world of, of food pairings that, that it sort of opens up to. You can pretty much throw the rule book away for, for conventional champagne pairing and, and go crazy and, and, you know, in the bigger ones, bring in uh, bigger meats and, and steaks and every desserts and anything like that. It works really, really well. So I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying the, the old tradition at the moment. Yeah. For me, old tradition, it's also the wines that uh, if people are drinking, I don't know, uh, Vefplico or Ruinard, uh, and they are quite hesitate uh, with a champagne grower, this is probably ultra tradition. It's the first step to enter into our middle because this is where here that you have also, as you said, you have the fruitiness, the aromatics, you have also some freshness. And after, if people are very happy with that, they could continue and discover the Blanc de Blanc or Vin d'Autrefois, etc. We don't forget, even as a grower, we like to do single vineyard cuvee and a very specific uh, champagne. But we also know that uh, champagne is the wine that you could... Uh, just enjoy with friends, uh, not necessarily without uh, with thinking about the terroir and etc. So it, it's uh, champagne have to be still a, a good moment of pleasure and celebration. So with this kind of wines, ultra tradition for me, for sure, is the wine that is uh, giving to us the biggest effort in order to find the, the character, but also the, the simplicity. And today I think simplicity, it's a kind of uh, luxe because uh, making real and having real good food and uh, the, the, the top wines, etc. It's uh, interesting. But to get the good wines or champagne for every day and just to enjoy with a good piece of bread and cheese, sometimes uh, this is the good moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree 100%. I, th I think most of us agree 100% on, on that one there. Um, but also show off as champagne. And yeah, yeah, we also like to show off that 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 we've bought grower champagne as well quite often here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's nice. Um, so I think we're gonna we're going to dive into the the single vineyard, the Levant Autrefois, the 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what yeah, we're sure. While we do go into it, you mentioned this is a, a single vineyard cuvee that you produced. Um, exactly. Well, so I'm sure that there there are lots of lots of like plots and as you mentioned earlier, a lot of a lot of work that goes into all the plots you farm. Is 
uh, what is it that sort of stands out uh, in a in a specific vineyard to you that that says you want to um, create a single vineyard wine off off that specific site? Yeah, I, I think yeah. As you, as I said before, we have eighty different plots. The idea is not necessarily to make eighty different wines. It will be not really uh, smart and uh, not very uh, pragmatic for us. But when sometimes it's just a good sense of uh, observation. Uh, you look the vines, I mean, there is the age of uh, this plot. It's uh, planted in uh, 1947 uh, by my old grandfather. Uh, you look, this is on the bottom of the hill. Uh, so this is where the choke is really important. Uh, so the terroir is really great. You look the vines, they are very healthy. The, when you do the, the vine growing, everything doing well, the grapes are very small, tiny. So even before pressing, you, you could think a lot that you will make a good wines in the, this kind of plots. Uh, after that, uh, you have also to, to challenge the, these plots because each vintage is different. So for me, when we start to make uh, this kind of cuvee with my father, we did her try for us. Uh, we started the Vin d'Autrefois first vintage officially in 2004. Uh, but the two, three years before, we did some uh, just a specific uh, bottling for us and to say, OK, does the, the plot work every year? Because for us, we want to do a vintage every year compared to the big brands that they say, OK, it's the best uh, vintage we did since the last uh, 10 years. For us, we believe that uh, we work well and uh, we work very hard and we arrive and we could present a vintage every year. So for me, this is uh, the, the, the plot. It's like that. Today we are doing, uh, I think, six wines with a single vineyard cuvee. It's quite important, but it's with the, also the experience, the history, and the different tries that we arrive to reveal this personality. Uh, that's the good thing. This is a small cuvee. This is only uh, three thousand bottles a year, so it's not a lot. Uh, I mean, when we want to, to spread out for the, each different market is not many uh, bottles. But for me, this is wines also to, to reflect the, the, the specific terroir, the cépage, etc. So here it's Pinot Meunier. As I say, Pinot Meunier, it's, uh, normally it's very fruity. But here it's an old vines with Selection Massal, with a little bit of uh, vines without fruit stock. And most important, is planted on the choke. It's really a good terroir for Chardonnay. Uh, so for me, this is more the choke, which is the support of the Pinot Meunier. So you have more sensation of terroir than variety. So here, the idea was to present a Pinot Meunier as fine as possible in a very classical and elegant way. 2016, a few words about this vintage. Uh, I will remember uh, for all my life uh, for this vintage. Uh, we had the frost uh, in the end of April. After we have very difficult season. The, in the months of June, it was raining 300 millimeters just in a month. So it was uh, every day was raining all the time. So the vines was uh, well, the vines like the, the rain, but not so much, not like that. Uh, and we finally, after beginning of September, the, the climate uh, changed a little bit, was uh, probably more uh, friendly with us, and we started harvest in uh, the 24, 26 of September. Uh, so that this Pinot Meunier was probably picked beginning of October. So the season was really, really hard, and I think you you could have uh, the sensation of the this difficulty in the vines. It was really, the, 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 we had uh, probably 30% less production than uh, normal, but the, the grapes who were still uh, here was very concentrated in emotion, in terroir, and in complexity. So for me, it's uh, 2016 is maybe not the best vintage for the journalists or etc. but for me, it's the best vintage we realized because we did a lot of effort. And I think the human part in the wines is uh, not enough taking in consideration. And, and uh, for us as a grower, especially as a grower, because we are human with strong character, uh, I think this is what we try to reflect. 
So this is the the single vineyard straight Pinot Meunier planted on on chalk uh, from 2016 that that we're tasting now in the room. Um, any first impressions? Up. It's a grown-ups. <laughs> it's a grown-ups wine. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so excellent, excellent fruit and um, a really good depth of flavor. The, the beautiful finishes, uh, so some of the comments coming through. Um, for me, I love that blend of freshness and savory undertones that, that really give it this amazing structure and backbone whilst being so elegant and light on its feet at the same time. Um, I, th I think that this is this is excellent. Um, yeah, you, I think you're right. No, sorry, yeah. yeah, it's a little bit contrasting. It's you have the the aromatic from the variety from the Pinot Meunier, but in the same time you have the the freshness, the salinity from the chalk, and you have uh, this combination of very savory but also uh, very fresh and a little bit energetic. And that's for me, it's uh, it's also something that we like to present. But again. My father, in the years uh, 90, 2000, he would like to create 100% Pinot Meunier, but there was nobody to, to buy and to drink 100% Pinot Meunier from single plots, uh, vintages. But now people say, okay, I'm curious, I'm open. And again, with probably better viticulture and vinification, we are able to present this kind of thing. So for me, this is, uh, yeah, the, 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 what we are the most happy is that people enjoy Pinot Meunier and discover it and uh, say that, okay, that's something I don't imagine it was uh, this kind of taste, etc. So, yeah, we are very happy with that. And just as uh, you mentioned earlier, you wanted to be making uh, every vintage of this wine. Uh, we will be seeing 17, 18, 19 and 20 moving forward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is again when... Uh, this morning, I was with the team uh, in the vines, uh, and it's the beginning of the, the growing season with the, like, uh, we have now uh, one month and a half of uh, very intense works to control everything. And I always say, like the briefing, it's, uh, okay, we, we have to do our best, our maximum. Uh, we don't know how the weather will be. We don't know yet uh, uh, the potential about the harvest, but all the, the works we are doing uh, during this moment, it's a little bit of details, but all the de these details at the end will make a big difference. And for me, 80% of the quality today, it's uh, in the vines. It's the terroir, of course, the terroir, you are not able to change it uh, very fast because it's taking a lot of time. But the works you do all, during all the year, the pruning, the growing vegetation, the control of the yield, etc., that's influenced a lot the quality. So even the bad, the quite medium or average vintages, Grower like us, I'm sure that we are making good wines. And this is what's happened also. You could, uh, you could see it in Burgundy. In Burgundy now, it's more the, the, the it's probably better to drink a Burgundy village from a very top producer, from an average uh, vintage, than a top cuvee from a negos uh, in a top vintage, because you know that uh, the quality and the work was not the same. Yeah, absolutely. Any final comments on the uh, Lavanda Archifile, the straight Pinot Meunier, before we move on? No. I think everyone's pretty happy just drinking away. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the, the, the last one we've got is the, uh, the Rosé de Meunier um, that, that we're trying. Just... Sorry. Exact. So Rosé de Meunier, as the name says, it's 100% uh, Pinot Meunier. Uh, you know that Pinot Meunier eats uh, a black variety. So, but white juice, so red skins, white juice. So like for Living d'autrefois, we could press it, they have a direct press. And after we could obtain a, a white wine. That's the idea of a blanc de noir. Uh, but with Pinot Meunier, we could do also a, a maceration. So a pink wine, and also we could do red wine. And this is what we do. Here in this wine, you have in fact, one variety, but three different types of vinification. So this is uh, the blend. It's 60% 60 60 direct press, 30% maceration, skin contact, like uh, 12, 18 hours of skin contact, and then 10% red wine. For me, what we like... 
to, to, to understand why we are doing that. It's the 10% red wines bring the body, the structure. The 60% uh, white wines bring freshness, uh, the, the white fruit uh, character. And the, the last 30%, which is a uh, maceration, skin contact, makes the link the, the, between the white and the red and brings vinosity and aromatics. So one variety, but with these three different uh, uh, vinification, you obtain a kind of also a new interpretation and a kind of harmony in the this rosé. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, like everything I mentioned, this is the, the exact same variety that we were drinking just before, made in three different wines um, to, to obtain a... a a deeper, darker, more brooding, more savory style of, of rosé wine. I think that, uh, like we saw in, in the, the, the Livonia Autrefois, that, that earthy, that backbone, that structure is really prevalent in here as well, along with that pretty elegant pink fruit and those beautiful pink florals that, that come through as well. It's, uh, like I say, I think it's a, it's a bit more of a, a grown-up version of, of rosé champagne at the same time. Um, yeah, this is looking fantastic. Yeah, and this rosé, the grapes are coming mostly from uh, Marne Valley. In Marne Valley, we have a lot of, uh, but the soil are more profound, we're a little bit richer, uh, big clay with the Marne, etc. So it gives a little bit more largeness to the Pinot Meunier, a little bit more body. But again, we don't forget uh, that we like freshness and uh, this kind of uh, drinkability. So this is why here it's uh, 2.5 grams of uh, dosage. Uh, just to reinforce the fruity character, but keep enough freshness to get the, the nice uh, and enjoyable uh, digestibility. And this is uh, base, uh, I think you are with base 2018 here. This is the base 18? Yeah. yeah. This is one. I think so. Is it just the, um, just the one rosé that you, that you make earlier? We do uh, another rosé, which is uh, a single plot, in fact, also from Pinot Meunier, because uh, we love Pinot Meunier. And uh, for me, this is the, the most interesting uh, things to, to realize. So Les Baudiers, it's a maceration of uh, all vines of Pinot Meunier, uh, but this is just 100% skin contact. So it's a real uh, rosé for uh, enjoying with food, very good character, strong personality, uh, and definitely... Uh, this rosé de Meunier that you have now, uh, you could enjoy by itself or with uh, some food. But the rosé de Seigné, the, the rosé de Maceration, are really uh, more venous and deeper in, uh, in colors, but also in character. So probably also good to, to enjoy with different food. Uh, mm -hmm. We are making these two rosé. Uh, this is, uh, for us, it's always uh, an interesting exercise because... Uh, Making white wines and champagne, it's uh, very interesting. But to working in another way with the Pinot Meunier, you open your uh, visibility and uh, your different ideas about the, the vinification. Today, our limit, this is just our imagination. In champagne, with a Pinot Meunier, you could do a white wine, you could do a rosé, you could red wine also. We are doing a Coteau Champenois from a Pinot Meunier. Uh, uh, we could also blend the different plots. We could do a single vineyard cuvée. So there is many things that you could do. But if you realize that you would like to present something, just let's go and bah, with a minimum of quality. I think it's the, it's the first important thing uh, to, to always remember. But uh, like the, the last bottling, we did 18 different wines in total. So it's, it's a lot, but uh, it's because we are very happy with all the different uh, wine we tasted. And we say, OK, we have to put this alone because we want to share with you uh, this typical vintage and uh, specific plots. Yeah, nice. And I think that the, the Coteau Champenois that Aurelien just mentioned, um, I don't know if it comes into Australia, but uh, is, a, is a still wine made from Champagne. Uh, it's made in very small quantities, I imagine. Yeah, uh, it's a small quantity. After, for the future, maybe the, the champagne will have more and more Coteau Champenois. Uh, also, maybe with the global warming that we have higher maturity, 
And uh, as a grower, this is always something uh, that we like to do. Uh, we'll see the future. Of course, champagne will stay with a lot of bubbles, uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But the Coteau Champenois, it's, uh, it's very promising also and uh, have a good future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do we have any thoughts on the, the rubric there? So this is one of the ones that we could even have with meat. Yeah, I think so. Would this be a, a wine that you would pair with the, the more daring, say, meats and, and steaks and those bigger roast dishes in that, in that way? Mm. Uh, Without problems at all. And, you know, when uh, it, it was... Uh, a few years ago, when you you could travel a lot, uh, the, the last uh, I was the, my last two trips was uh, in uh, in uh, in Seoul in South Korea, and with the spice, uh, I was a little bit afraid. But in fact, with the rosé, the character and with the meat, etc., was working very well. Uh, but also after I go to Japan and Japan with uh, the the raw fish and the sashimi, this kind of rosé was also pairing very well. So. Probably with wine food pairing, the champagne rosé, you have probably a lot of different things to try. Uh, like with the meats, with uh, also, uh, as I say, like uh, Spanish ham, uh, like the patanagra, uh, that could work quite well. Uh, but also the things from the sea, some shrimp uh, could be very interesting. Uh, and uh, yeah, many, I I'm not the sommelier, but uh, please be curious. Don't hesitate to, to try it. There is no mistake. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm starting to get a little bit hungry now as well. Um, too <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, was that, 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 that's the, the four ones we had to try uh, tonight from, from yourself, really. And um, I just wanted to say a, a huge thank you and um, for joining us and, and taking us through all these wines. I know that it is a very, very busy time in your life there. So um, yeah, I did just want to say a, a massive thank you for joining us and, and taking us uh, uh, through that, through those four wines there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Merci. And, uh, thank yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and enjoy the tasting uh, with Arthur and uh, yeah. I'm very. Uh, I was very happy to to do that uh, with you and to to take uh, to share a little bit of uh, information. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Hopefully, we will we will have you here in Australia very shortly. Yeah, probably. Uh, we'd be very happy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> we've uh, we're always had the intro to starting on, but um, I did as we move into the second half of the tasting after four excellent wines. Um, I'm certain we have four more excellent wines to come. Um, I did just want to introduce um, Arthur Lamania from Champagne Lamania Bernier, um, standing next to me here in the taste room in a, in a virtual uh, space. Um, and uh, we, uh, you know, we, 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 we sort of had a little look at, at the the, um, the Laveau champagnes and that sort of style. But uh, after you to take us through um, what sort of uh, what about La Mania Bernier, about yourself and and uh, and the um, the champagnes that, that uh, you produce and that we'll be trying. Mm -hmm. Hello, happy to be here with you tonight. Um, so I'm Arthur Lamondi from the Champagne Lamondi Bernier. Um, so I'm working with my parents at La Monde Bernier now since four years. Uh, my parents are uh, working with uh, creating La Monde Bernier since 30 years now. But the La Monde family has a really long history of making champagne back uh, to the previous centuries. So La Monde Bernier now it's a family estate. Huh? Uh, we run it with my parents. No, no chef de cave, no chef de culture. Uh, we want to make champagne that look like us. So we think that the easier is to make the champagne by ourselves. Um, of course, we don't do. We have a team working with us of ten people in the vineyards and in the cellar. They are quite um, quite polyvalent. La Monte Bernier is uh, almost uh, 18 hectares in all the Côte des Blancs. So Côte des Blancs from Vertu, the village where uh, the cellar is, up to Cramont, uh, north of the Côte des Blancs. Now um, we put we. We are certified organic and we are also working biodynamically. We are under certification of biodynamic. We are, uh, will be, uh, the 2021 vintage will be the first certified by Biodivin. Alors, we've been working like this for a long time. Uh, my dad uh, started working with the biodynamic preparations 
uh, back in the 90s. But the idea here was more to, to get uh, a certification for export, for example, and also for, for you to understand that a lot of people are talking, but not doing things. And uh, we are talking and doing things. That's what we wanted to, to do with this certification. So tonight we will taste several wines. Um, almost uh, well, three of them will be Blanc de Blanc because uh, Chardonnay represents 90% of our production. All our Pinot Noir are exclusively going in our rosé that you will have tonight also. And uh, in the wine you will taste, you will have some uh, single Bagnard cuvée and some blend. The idea is, is we think that we have a really nice terroir. Uh, I heard a little bit, not everything that Aurelien said, but uh, he explained it quite well that we have different terroir in the Côte de, in the Champagne. And even inside the Côte des Blancs, we have different terroir. And that's what we want to show with the, our different single Vanier Scuvé. Uh, and then the blend, it's more, uh, it's more the, the style of the house and how we, we, we like uh, uh, a nice Champagne to share with friends. So the first one uh, you have is Latitude, I think. Yes, yes, latitude will be the be the first one that we're tasting. So, uh, so we want me to speak about latitude, or maybe you, you want us to discuss about Clermont Bernier a little bit before. I would we'll be more than happy if you have questions. Uh, well, I only had one that um, that you just brought up um, just then, actually, but uh, was about the the farming, and and you're obviously uh, sort of heading towards certified biodynamic, and I think it's interesting when we talk about grower champagne is that's not something that pops up very often. And you say that organic and especially biodynamic farming is maybe not something uh, very common in, in the region when it comes to grower producers or producers in general? No, being organic is not common. People start to understand that uh, there is an interest in uh, plowing, for example, but uh, not a lot of people are making the full... Uh, the full gap, uh, taking the full uh, ride, if I, we can say, um, because plowing is one thing, but the most difficult is all about uh, the treatments during the growing season right now, uh, because we don't. I always compare it to to weapons. We don't have the big bazooka, you know. We we can only prevent with copper, sulfur, and we and that's where for us biodynamic is really important. Is that we help. Uh, the vines to fight naturally against uh, these uh, diseases that are mildew and odium. With the biodynamic, we bring back balance. So then we need even less products in organic. We think that thanks to biodynamic, it's easier to be organic because we have more balance into our, into our vines. And then of course, the next step is also the deepness in our wine, the purity uh, that, that will come after in the taste of the grapes. But of course, no, being organic, not a lot of people is certified. Um, in the village of Vertu, for example, it's almost uh, something around a bit more than 500 hectares, just the village. Huh? We are three growers certified organic. So it, we, we represent maybe, maybe 40 hectares, less, 30. <laughs> so you know, it's a really small part. People are still, uh, a lot of people still are still thinking that we cannot be organic. Uh, in Champagne because of the weather. But uh, of course it's tough, but uh, if we want to make something good, we think we have to work a little bit more <laughs> and harder, but that's a bet that we want to take. Absolutely. Um, and when, when, when it comes to that, uh, do you think, I mean, is it, is it growing where maybe the people around you or the, the region as a whole is, um, you know, are people starting to change their minds? I know here in Australia, it's definitely a, a growing cause among, among uh, great growers, but... Definitely it's growing uh, because people are starting to know that uh, it's a key also to, for the taste, for deepness, for uh, adapting to the climate change also. Uh, and the best example is that when my dad started uh, to plow and to stop the chemicals uh, back in 1992, uh, 1993, people were looking at him like he was crazy, like it was impossible and like he was bringing disease everywhere. Now people are more looking at me and, more, and my dad, like, how do we do that? They're more curious, more asking questions. Um, they are more, they are, for example, they, they are not, um, how can I say? 
they are okay if we, sh you know, in the role that we share, they are okay to have grass, most of them. Before, no, there was uh, almost praying in our first row <laughs> to make sure that we don't bring grass to them. So no, I think we really see changing because for me, it's way much more easier to be organic compared to my dad 30 years ago. That's the most difficult thing. After, it's not because people are understanding it that they're doing it. <laughs> but at least they respect, they are respecting what we do. So it's, it's become easier to be organic. That's, that's, that's good to hear, I think. Um, but the, the, the main change will come because the big houses will want uh, grapes organic, that are certified organic. So people that are only uh, selling grapes, they don't see an interest of being organic, except if they have an increase of the price by the big houses. And because the demands even for the big houses is coming, I think it will come by at the end. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good to say, I think. Um, so we, we all have, um, have latitude in our glass, the first from the bomb. <laughs> I will share with you, it's almost lunchtime in France, so it's perfect. So latitude. So um, latitude, we call it this way because um, it's, uh, we wanted to put together plots with the same type of soil. So we have chalk everywhere in the Côte des Blancs, but this chalk may be deep, um, have different deepness. And south of Vertu, in the same latitude, um, this chalk is more at one meter, one meter 50 of depth, which is quite high for us. Normally it's more closer to the surface. So we have a wine which is a bit more rich, a bit more warm, so perfect for aperitifs for, so it will please the, most of the palate. But what is nice is that because you still have some chalk a bit deeper, we still have some roots in connection with this chalk. So we still at the end have this little tension, a uh, little sometimes salinity that is coming, which give a great balance between this roundness and this tension. So blend of plots, but it's also a blend of years. Um, I think you should have a 2017 base. It represents uh, around uh, two thirds of this wine. And the last third is the same blend of plots, but from previous year. We work with the perpetual reserve that we started in 2004. The mm -hmm. idea is that we make our big blends of latitude and we don't bottle everything. What, what's not bottled is, putting, is, is put back on the reserve wine. And that's how we renew our reserve every year. But we like to have this two thirds of, of uh, vintage so that from one, one base to one to another, the wine is still changing a little bit. We still have a small influence. We don't want to erase the total influence of the vintage. So it's extra brut hein, as all what we do. Uh, latitude is actually the highest dosage that we are making. And this one is at four grams. We really believe in, in low dosage. For us, low dosage is like seasonings, you see? Uh, at the end, you don't want, we don't want you to smell some sugar, but it just helps to develop some aromas. Because for me, if you smell the sugar, you bring some heaviness to the wine. That's not what we are looking for. We want something fresh, something that you can enjoy and want another, another glass. Does the, does the dosage remain relatively the same each, each cuvee that's produced? Um, no, it's different, different each cuvee, and even in the same cuvee, we might change the dosage. Before each disgorgement, we retaste the wine to adjust uh, with my dad and mom the dosage we want. For example, um, longitude, when I came back four years ago, four years ago not 40, <laughs> it, used to be, um, it used to be four, but uh, with the last vintage, which was a little bit warmer, we felt no need of four grams, so we bring it down to three. It doesn't say that we won't go up to, back to four, um, but we just want to adapt ourselves to each vintage. Mm. Oh, sorry. The, 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 the best thing is to have no rules. If you have too much rules, you stay, you stay stuck in these rules, and so you don't adapt yourself to, uh, to your wines, which is the nature, so the nature you need to adapt yourself. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody have any comments or questions on the first one, the, the latitude that we've tried? The straight bottom to bottom? 
Children, we ask you to talk a little bit about the fermentation vessels under the content uh, A. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, Nick, Nick just mentioned on the back there that uh, use a, a variety of fermentation vessels in the, the vinification process. And uh, one of the more unusual is the, the egg-shaped um, vessels that we use, uh, like are up on the screen now. <laughs> so, um, so it's the egg-shaped, we'll talk about it later because they are, we use them for the, for the rosé. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. But uh, what, what um, then the rest is in the oak, that you saw around you, around the eggs. Uh, in this room, we, we have uh, enough oak to raise all the vintage. So all our wine, except the rosé, uh, are going through oak for their first year. And what we do is that we press, and then the juice are going directly to each vat, and each vat will make its own fermentation naturally. We really let each vat having its own life. For us, it's important because we, we try as much as we can to isolate each plot in each vat. So by this, you, you can make sure that it will be the yeast that has been growing in the plot with the grapes that is making the fermentation. And so you have the, the perfect match between the grapes and the yeast. So you, you respect the taste. And also, we really believe that you have more efficiency because the vines is creating the yeast that is corresponding to the grapes that she's making. And then, uh, that's what we are doing right now. Uh, we taste each vat to blend together to make the latitude and the longitude. Uh, for, the, for the single vineyard, it's easy, you don't blend. <laughs> you just take the vats. Uh, actually, what we do for the single vineyards, we do, a, we call it a positive selection. We taste all the vats from this place just to make sure that they meet our uh, expectation for this plot. And otherwise, it's going in latitude or longitude. And when it comes to where, I think we're, we're just moving on to longitude now, but um, with these two cuvées, is it fair to say they're almost like a brother and sister to each other or, or in, in that sense? Yes, exactly. Um, they are brother and sister because they are, they are raised next to each other. The difference is really about the soil. Um, here, in Latin longitude, it's uh, north of Vertu and then Auger, Cramont, and Aviz in the Côte des Blancs. We go north and we go in plots where the chalk is a bit um, closer to the surface. You have more 30, 50 centimeters of topsoil and then you directly have the chalk. So it means you have more exchange between the roots and the, and the, and the chalk. So you have more minerality, more tension, more, um, yeah, more almost salinity. I think uh, sometimes, two times I, I can feel at the end of your mouse. So that's why we wanted to make two different cuvées, to really have this different style uh, in, the, in the different wine. Apart from, that, apart from that, they are making quite the same way. Huh? Um, it's also a base 17 that you have in your glass, I think. And it's also two thirds of, base, of uh, base wine and one, one third of reserve wine. We also have a perpetual reserve, but really even in our uh, reserve uh, cuvrie, we keep one reserve for latitude, one reserve for longitude, because we want to keep this uh, particularity of each cuvée. Uh, latitude, longitude. <laughs> Immediately for me, um, lower, you have three grams. So one gram less than the latitude? Yeah, but might change, we adapt ourselves from one disgorgement to another. I think immediately for me, I see more of that, a little bit more generosity of fruit. It's maybe doesn't quite have the, the racy acidity, but it's a bit rounder and a bit more mouth filling and has more of that stone fruit kind of nose, I think, which is quite fascinating for, for two wines that from, from different sites, but um, raised in a similar fashion. And what I really like is that they are raised in the same perimeter of 20 kilometers. The Côte des Blancs is not so big. Huh? You have 20 kilometers from Vertu to Cramont. So latitude is at the south of these 20 kilometers and longitude is all the rest. But uh, the, the thing is that uh, millions of years ago, something collapsed on the chalk in the south of the Côte des Blancs. That's why the chalk is a bit deeper. And that's why we make two different points. Hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, there's something, there's something different. Absolutely. So the, 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 the statement was that um, the wines that we've tasted tonight, and, and especially these last two, they don't seem to quite have the yeasty, brioche kind of buttery characteristics, I think, that maybe we get from some of the bigger brand, more well-known names that we see here in Australia. No, no, because um, we really, really found more the, the Chardonnay on choke with the quite, I don't like this word, but poor uh, topsoil. You don't have clay in this kind of topsoil because we see it, we have some clay in the north of the Côte des Blancs in Cramont. Uh, and we have a single vineyard cuvée where we have a lot of clay. And here you can feel this brioche, this butteriness. And, um, and so that's not the place uh, where we go latitude and longitude. And the second thing why I think we don't have this uh, more brioche is also because we don't want to have too much uh, vin de réserve. You see, we, we keep it at one third. We don't want to have this... Uh, with vin de réserve, you can make uh, young wine look more aged. You see? Um, so we don't want to go too deep in that. We want to respect also the, the two third of the vintage that we produced. And also the, our, uh, our uh, reserve wine. So they spent all their, all their wine their first year in oak, but after they are in stainless steel. So we don't want them to be too much on oxidation. We want to keep the purity, the salinity, the freshness. So we, we don't want to cultivate this, uh, this heaviness, if I can say. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, and the, the, the Chardonnay purity that we've seen in the last two, I think shines for, for me as well. It really has that that beautiful natural acidity and, and like you said, that dosage, you don't see any of that sugar in there. It's more about that fruit freshness and, and purity coming through. Um, I think this is exceptional. And one big difference, but it's uh, true for all the domain, huh? for all our grapes, is also a question of yields. Because with the Chardonnay, if you push it too much, you will have to, how can I say, to, to harvest a bit early because you don't want to have to, to uh, rot because if you have if, if, if you have too big harvest uh, it will rot more which much, much more quicker so then also they need that's why they need to uh, make a higher dosage because they have less natural sugar for us we make the bet to work before in our vineyards to lower the yields so because we have concurrent with the grass because we have old vineyards and then at the end we have not a bad, but a normal yield uh, for champagne, which allows us to push a nice maturity. Most of the time we harvest about five days after the rest of the village. But thanks to that, we have what I call a mature acidity. So you have this acidity, but in the meantime, you have great sugar. So that's why we have, it's rich without this heaviness, because for me, the heaviness is coming from the sugar that is added. If you have natural sugar, it's not the same, it's uh, integrated. And, and added sugar is something you would see more of in the, the larger production ones. Sorry? Uh, you, would would uh, adding sugar be something more common in, say, the more commercial wineries? Yeah, yeah, and I think it's not also or because they want to do that. It's also because if I was speaking about the fact that we take decisions with my dad and, uh, and, my, and my mom, we take decision about the harvest date. We look at the grapes when they're coming in and we can make the bets of risk, being risky about the road because we are working on the line. Uh, maybe one or two days after, we lose everything. <laughs> but it's a bet about quality. And for them, because it's bigger structure, they cannot do that. Maybe they won't, but they cannot because the uh, grapes are coming from the three quarters, from the three corner of the four corner of the Champagne area. They need to travel. Um, they don't control always. Uh, and when you are selling your grapes, you don't take risk. You, as soon as you get uh, the asking maturity, you harvest, you go and you are sure that you won't be refused. So maybe they want to do better, but it's difficult for them because of the size. That's, that's what, where we are lucky to be small. We can control everything. Or maybe I'm too much of a control freak, <laughs> but uh, at least we can really do exactly what we want. And we have a lot of flexibility. Cool. I think, I think the very large part of that commercial brand 
Sorry, I'm, I'm not hearing you quite well. <laughs> I was saying that, uh, that, that uh, weather in Sydney is, is doing the best impression of the Champagne region. Um, I can't imagine you'll see any grapes coming out of here anytime soon, though. So we've had nothing but, but, but cold and, and rain for three days. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so for us, it's warm and really warm, almost uh, 30 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And so for um I had to, I had to ask uh, really an earlier, but how has um how has the the um the, the vintage leading in so far for uh, for 2021 been for you at the moment? Uh 2021 for so far is not the best vintage. <laughs> no, it's quite tough. Um we got frost beginning beginning of April because March, end of March starting quite nicely. And then uh, the temperature collapsed. And so we lost almost 20, 25% of the grapes. And we see if there is more because when it frosts, you see the, the bed, which frost, so it's damaged. It's easy to count how many you lost. But what you don't see is how much your vines has been stressed. And we see it uh, in the next two, two weeks because the flower is on the making. And sometimes a vine that is stressed after the flower, um, in, in French we say couler, it means that they make the flower and then you lose the grapes. Because you, you got stressed, it was too cold. And so we know sure that we lost 20% and maybe it will be more according to how the stress has been handled by the vines. And then the temperature never went up uh, so much. So the vine started, but uh, not in a good pace. So it was tough. Uh, the, the, the vines were yellow because they were cold. Uh, so it was um, and rainy also with a lot of storm. So a lot of people were afraid that uh, 2021 will look like 2016. So hopefully for us since June, it's, it's fine. We got one big rain, but Rain is not a problem if you have good weather before and good weather after, so that you can cover yourself with the treatment. <laughs> because when you are organic, you know, the main difference between organic and chemicals is that we never go inside the plants. Because when you go inside, if it's raining, it's okay because it's in, it's in the organism of the plants. The plant just digests the product uh, more quicker, but that's another problem. But when you are organic, you're only on the leaf, on the grapes, so after according to the different trial, after more than 20 millimeters, we are naked. So we have to, to reprotect ourselves. 
So if it's fine, if we can treat before and right after, it's fine. So June looked like cool, <laughs> the, but uh, we have a next problem coming is that the flower should happen uh, mid of next week and the rain should come back mid of next week, next week. And rain and flower together is not a good thing. But uh, we'll see, huh? sometimes after, uh, even if the vintage is tough to make, sometimes it's made, it's make really good wine. Uh, it was the case with 2012. Huh? 2012 was really tough to make, but the end was perfect. So we got a really great vintage. Doesn't mean because it's tough to make that it won't be good. Sometimes it's even uh, an opposite relation. Yeah, I really did mention earlier that that 2016, he, he said that uh, maybe it wasn't the, the wine journalist's favorite year, but was a favorite year for him with the results that, that came through. Yeah, I, I was lucky. I decided to come back uh, on the winter uh, seven, uh, at the end of, 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 six, of 16. So I didn't work, I wasn't back yet on 16. It's only what my dad told me. He told me it was the worst year he had to do in 30 years. <laughs> And since since 2017, it's quite uh, the vintage are, are quite nice. Huh? They, yeah. they are nice in taste. They are also nice to do, but it's it's also thanks to the global warming. And with the global warming, it's becoming easier and easier to to be in organic because we have less and less rain uh, during the winter summer seasons. Yeah, right. We so are... we went on Pierre de Vertu. Yeah, we're on the, the, the uh, first vintage from Blanc that we're trying from for me now, which is the 2014 Tour de um, So 2014, it was a quite normal vintage. Huh? The harvest was in 2000, uh, uh, what was mid, uh, mid September, but still it was a nice sunny vintage. So we have a Terre de Vertu, which is a bit more richer compared to the 13. I don't know if some people in the room may have tasted the vintage before, but um, the main difference is here. 13 was really co more cold compared to 14. So 14 is a bit more richer. But what we like is that we still have this tension at the end of Terre de Vertu. Uh, that we are, is almost the reason why we decided to make this in the Valley Artes uh, We make Terre de Vertu since almost 20, 25 years now. The, the idea is that during the tasting of uh, Vin Clair, when we want to make the blending, because we vinificate each plot separately, this plot, we said, oh, there is something nice. There was something we really liked about. Uh, we, my parents at this time, I was uh, three years old. But um, something that they liked about this plot, so we they decided to, to put it apart and to make it all by itself. And since then, we are really happy with that because Really, really like the balance between the power at the beginning, the almost spiciness at the beginning, and the tension that is coming back at the end. We really like this balance, and that's why we want to do it every year to see how this balance is uh, is expressing itself uh, towards the different vintages. So I think we have almost all the vintage since since 1995. I think we are just missing 21. Uh, Right, 21, 2001. Will you make a 2021? No, tw no, not 2021. Yes, I think we just don't have the, the 2001 because it was a bad vintage. <laughs> but 21, we see, I think, I hope, but there is a, um, I don't know what is the word in English for that, but there is a dicton in French. So it's something that people are saying in the vineyards that, um, how can I translate that? The years in one are a year of nothing. <laughs> because you got 11, which was not the best year. You got one, from 2001, who was bad. 91 was bad. 81 was bad, apparently. <laughs> so I hope we will make it uh, false. So, so bad luck to anybody for winning any of those years. <laughs> that, one, that one's the drink champagne. <laughs> so Terre de Vertu, it's really one plot. Um, it's making in, uh, we always make a big um, 50 hectoliters vats. And then the rest is uh, raised in uh, five liters, five, 500 liters uh, vats. So we get some, some oxidation from the small one and some reduction from the big one. So we have a nice balance between the two types of vats. And then uh, it's bottled with everything else in July. 
and we keep it between four to five years in our cellar before we release it. And it's a brut nature, always. We never put any dosage. No, no dosage at all. No, never. From one year to another, we never put any. The idea is to really like this purity at the end, and we think it's matching quite well with this tension that you have at the end of the mouth. Absolutely. What does everybody think of the, the, the single medium bump to bump that we try after doing the latitude, longitude, and then jumping into the, the vintage? Yeah, yeah, it does have a rightness and that, that sort of again that, that intensity of fruit I think is is fantastic, but all balanced out for for, for no dosage I think is is fantastic. Um, uh, the water, do you know what it was that that, that drew your parents towards the sort of a two plot to to create this the single vineyard cuvee? Sorry. Uh, do you know what, what was special about Tour de Vertu that, that they wanted to craft it into its own wine? What we really would like if I liked is that when you, you dig up in the plots, you have maybe that of topsoil, and then you have the chalk. So we were expecting, my parents were expecting when you take the, the wine something nice, but only on the purity, only on the saltiness, and something um, really linear, you see, uh, only on the chalkiness. And they were really surprised that I th we, always, we are still trying to explain why we still have this spiciness, this powerness at the beginning in your mouth. We think it's thanks to the exposure, uh, also because we have, it's quite old vineyards. Huh? In Terre de Vertu, the average uh, age of the vines is 65 years old. So we think it's this combination of different things make it so it was different than what we expected and so it's something we liked and um, and then we like this balance so that's why uh, they decided 25 years ago to go with this uh, single vineyard cuvee it was a tough decision because since 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 then it's a uh, non dosé and at this time a single vineyard cuvee blanc de blanc non dosé it was not so 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 asked Alors, thanks, we have some good people like Bibendum uh, that was supporting us. But, um, and now it's, it's what, almost what is representing our house, Terre de Vertu, because it's the blanc de blanc on the chalk for its purity, no, no seasonings or no makeup, um, with, because there is no dosage. And uh, a lot of people know them through, through this cuvee because we are lucky to have almost two hectares in this place. So we managed to produce uh, almost. Uh, 18, uh, 20,000 uh, bottles. Wow. This wine. It's, it's, it's different according to each vintage, huh, but it's an average uh, number. Yeah, that's nice. well, if you, if you do ever have trouble getting rid of some, I'm sure Australia will take anything that's left over. Um, uh, so we move on to the last one now that everyone has in their glass, which is the Rosé de Sagne. Um, to finish on. So the Rosé de Seigne, sorry, I have an empty bottle, it's not nice. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a maceration. The, the idea is quite simple. We got it 20 years ago. We didn't want to keep on making a Rosé that was uh, the taste of a Chardonnay with the color of Pinot Noir. We just wanted to get back the, 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 the taste of Pinot Noir that we like. The, this uh, nice strawberry, this um, red berries, fruits, fruitiness. So we we a little change our assemblage because before we get some Pinot Noir in other uh, cuvee and to get all our Pinot Noir in only one cuvee in this in this Rosé de Seigne. So it's a pure vertu. We have three plots, uh, old, uh, old vineyards that are almost 60 years old. On that, I'm really lucky because Vertu used to be a vineyard with some Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but with the renown of the Côte des Blancs for its Chardonnay, people tend to, to take out the Pinot Noir to plant back Chardonnay because they were more confident about selling these kind of grapes. But neither my grandpa or my dad uh, makes this choice, so we still have this uh, nice uh, three plots of Pinot Noir in Vertu 
and we make the rosé thanks to this uh, cuts. So the technique is a normal technique of making a rosé, actually. It's a, it's a blend, which is a not normal technique, if we can say, <laughs> because it's only in Champagne that where you can blend red and uh, white to get some uh, rosé. So what we do is that we harvest, uh, most of the time we harvest them first, because of uh, Pinot Noir is more mature compared to Chardonnay, and they go quicker. And then everything goes on the sample table because we want to uh, make a maceration. So we raise some uh, old water, uh, not nice. But not only the rot, and also if it's uh, too green or not ripe enough, because we don't want to have some green, green acidity in the mouth. And then we launch a maceration, a cold maceration. We have a big tanks, which is refrigerated. Because thanks to this refrigeration, the fermentation is not starting. So about the, the taste we extract, it's more about the fresh fruits that we can extract. Because if you extract during a fermentation, you may extract some tannin also. And we don't want to make red wine. We want to stay on the nice rosé. And then, so the wine, depends on the year, but almost one third is going in the eggs that we saw on the picture before. And the rest is goes in stainless steel. Why we make these two different types of content is because with the shape of the eggs, the wine tends to move a little bit more compared to another shape. So the wine tends to fill itself more with the lees, it gives more body, more structure, something more powerful. So it's being one side of the rosé. And on the other side, we have the inox, which is bringing some freshness, some tension. And then we blend these two in July for the bottling. And the wine that you have in your glass should be a 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, because the rosé, even if on the label you don't have any vintage, it's always a one year wine. It's easy it's because in Champagne, if you want to put the vintage on the label, you have to keep the wine three years in your cellar. And we don't want to wait these three years. We want to, 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 to have a rosé which is on the freshness, on the nice fruits, not too much evolution. So we, we decided to sell it quite young. So that's why uh, it's one year, it's only one vintage, but it's not on the label. And both uh, th this one here and the last one that we tried, the two of the two are both Premier Cru vineyards in Champagne? Yes, so they are Premier Cru. In Champagne, you have the, the, Cru, the Cru. It's about, uh, it's about the villages. It's not about one place, it's about the whole villages. So you have Vertu, which is premier cru, and we have, for example, Cramant, uh, Auger, Avis, which are grand cru. We have almost only grand cru and premier cru. And, uh, alors for us, it's, it's nice. I think it's a good first indication for people who are not uh, a big expert in Champagne. After, if you go deeper in the Champagne, uh, under the stand, I think it's a little bit less accurate. Because, for example, if you take Terre de Vertu, it's one place in Vertu, so it's Premier Cru. But I think it's better than the worst place in Cramont, you see? <laughs> What was because, because it's the whole village which is ranking. Alors, it's true that if you blend all the grapes from Vertu and you compare them to all the grapes blend from Cramont, Vertu, uh, Cramont may go higher. That's why it's Grand Cru. But when you go to get precise to see, and talking about single vineyards cuvée, you may lose a bit of precise precision. But it's true that for me, if you, if you don't know a lot about champagne and you want it's give you a first idea, huh? if it has been rated like this, it means that you have something good. Enfin, at, at the beginning, you have a good terroir. So it gives a first indication for people uh, that they are in a good terroir. After people might uh, uh, preserve what they have been given by these grapes or making uh, too much uh, too much chemicals and too much uh, raising or too much changing, but at least you have a first indication. Does anyone have any comments or any questions on uh, the last rosé that we tried? Just try it now. No, it's just gorgeous. Yeah. Just, it's very, of, of all the wines we've looked at tonight, it's the most pronounced in the last on the nose. Yeah, I think for, for me, what I find most interesting about this and, and trying Aurelian's earlier on was that the, the, the Pinot Mounier Rosé that he makes, it was quite savoury and quite earthy and structured and almost had a, a bit of grip towards it, whereas um, this, this wine here is so 
pretty and pronounced and really has all that lovely red fruit and red berry kind of notes towards it whilst maintaining that beautiful acidity and, and kind of natural leaf that, that I think is incredible. Because it's written in Vertu, so even if it's Pinot Noir, we still have the choke huh, underneath. So thanks to the choke, oak, it's, it's more expressive on Chardonnay, but still on this Pinot Noir, it's, it's given this nice acidity, nice tension uh, that we have. And here you have a really low dosage, you have only two grams, because we want to preserve this nice tension, nice acidity uh, that we have. It's true that for people uh, that are not used to our rosé, it's a bit um, confusing because the people in champ for rosé champagne are more used to something more sweet uh, to pair with dessert. Here you cannot pair it with dessert. It's too much on, on the freshness, too much on the acidity. Um, so it's, it's way much better. What I really like is just about aperitif because it's, it's confused people. People like rosé, champagne, and aperitif. Why are you doing that? It's not what it's used to. And when they taste it, it's, it's quite well with just the, the aperitif. Or then you can go on, uh, on fresh, fresh tuna. Or, and once in the restaurant in Reims, I got it with a pigeon. So I was not expecting it, but a pigeon, not to cook, it's uh, perfect. I learned something. Yeah, that's fantastic. Hmm. Cool. Um, also, are there any other further um, questions for, for Arthur? Um, I did just want to say another a, a huge thank you to, to Arthur Lamagia for all the way from Champagne for, for joining as well and then taking us through these um, four incredible wines. Um, I know both Aurelian and yourself are, are incredibly busy getting ready for uh, getting ready for, for vintage coming up. So um, to take time out of your day to, to share with us here in Windy Old Sydney is um, is a massive honour. So th th thank you, Arthur, for, for, for that. My pleasure. Thank you for having me and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Goodbye. Yeah, I hope we'll see you in Australia very shortly. Yes. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.